Oh, I'm going to open Hello, the Hello, welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 81, Too Fast, Too Furious. Quick and easy, two-player games. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, of Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in Twitch lobby. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash bellhop. All right, tonight we've got someone looking for quick and easy two-player games. I've got a couple of reviews. Oh, only one review. Sorry, I didn't get the other one finished. I got one review for you tonight. That's going to be of the trick-taking, gory, gladiatorial card game Gorus Maximus. And it's a... Sh Shorter week in review, Bellhop's Tabletop with only two games, uh, unfortunately due to some family illness, not a lot of gaming the last week, but we will be talking about Clans of Caledonia and my first play of an older Aaliyah game, Artis. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Now, we have a ton of comments this week about our show from two weeks ago, where we were talking about great older games worth seeking out and playing. Yeah, this one seems to have touched a lot of people. We got a lot more feedback than usual. There are definitely some passionate fans of older games out there. Up first, a couple of RPG recommendations from Brady Michael Boyd, Space Opera, and Chivalry and Sorcery. Wow, Space Opera. That, that is an older, classic, big my god um complex uh i don't I, it has a reputation um that and all games from fantasy games unlimited are notorious for how complicated and hard they are to play so i know they have their fans obviously um brady's one of them but they are definitely not for me uh that is not a a genre of games i picked up albedo just to have it uh, what's the other? Bushido is the other one. I actually picked up a copy of that too, but more for as a collector, because my God, I started looking through that. Now, Chivalry and Sorcery, I always thought of as a modern game that came out during the D20 glut. I had no clue it was from 1978 and still going strong. That one, I'm, I'm going to guess if you're a fan of space opera, it's probably also a heavier, more gritty simulationist game, but I haven't played it myself. All right, well, James Mullen writes, I mean... Avalon, Civil Hills. Avalon Hills Civilization is for sure worth a play. Car Wars is probably also worth playing. Even the newer, larger scale game is worthy of at least a run. Cathedral is for sure worth a play also. I can't think of any good RPGs that haven't been reprinted. I mean, I got nostalgic feelings for After the Bomb TMNT. Heaven knows I wouldn't recommend playing it anymore. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks, James. Uh, there are definitely a lot of Avalon Hill Civilization fans out there. Like I said, I mentioned the local gamers here are big fans during that episode. I don't know if I met called out Charles by name, but it is still his favorite game of all time. And that's someone who has played a lot of games, probably as many as I have, and whose quick collection even dwarfs mine. And to this day, he still loves Avalon Hill Civilization. Now, Car Wars, that's another one from a time gone past, right? Uh, it kind of, to me, goes with, it's, it's like the board game version of those fantasy game unlimited games, right? Games like that and Starfleet Battles, to me, are the same type. These simulationist games striving for realism. And, and I see the appeal, but I got to admit, like, I own an old copy of Deluxe Car Wars, and it's, it's a little too fiddly and, you know, six hours to fight out two fights. Just a bit much nowadays. But, hey, if you're a fan, all the power to you. Uh, Cathedral is a good one. I ended up, I, I almost put that on the list. It was between that and Corridor, and I went with Corridor instead for similar um, heirloom-style wooden games. Now, going back to the Palladium system, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. I don't see any appeal to go back to it. Um, though what I would love, like, love, love, love to see, they did it with Rifts. They put out Shadow, or not Shadow Run, Savage Worlds Rifts. Please, Palladium, let out that TMNT license. I would love to see a modern TMNT game. 
And in particular, I'm thinking it'd be great for the, the Marvel superheroes, Marvel heroic role playing system or the Sentinels multiverse system, maybe something Cortex Plus or Cortex Light. I would love to see a modern TMNT game, please. All right. Well, Samewise 7 RPG writes, Harps, Kiridan, and Avalon Hills Titan come to mind. Well, thanks, Samwise. Now, Harp, uh, I'm assuming they're talking about the role-playing system. That's another one that I was curious about. That was a, a historic, it was going for the, the medieval era of D&D, but without any of the fantasy. So like playing actual knights and vassals in the feudal system. Um, I don't know anyone that actually locally played it. Like it was a game that came out when we were gaming at the University of Windsor and just like, no, I don't know anyone that plays Harp, which is kind of weird. So I know very little about it, except that it, again, it's more of a simulationist game. Now, Titan, that's a solid game. I do have a copy of that one, one of the more modern reprints. The problem with that game is it's a really good game. It's a really long game though. Like you're looking at like a five hour game and it features player elimination. And it's probably gonna happen, especially if you're playing with three or more players, is someone's gonna get knocked out early. And then what's that person do, right? They were eliminated in the first half hour of a five hour game. So that's why to me, that one doesn't shine for me to be on the list. Although we did do an episode about talking about ways, uh, you know, if you get eliminated, yes. you got something else, you can go do something else. That uh, is true. So uh, Phil uh, Viver uh, Viverito writes, Star Frontiers and Adeptus Titanicus combined. Nice. Uh, no, what's awesome is everyone's recommending both board games and RPGs. I just noticed that. Like, I didn't click in when I was first reading these. That's great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Star Frontiers. Here's another classic RPG. It was like the D&D &D in space. That was the, the sci-fi game you played, unless you were from the UK, then you played Traveler. Then again, no one local, no one I know played Star Frontiers. Like, it just never took off here. So I never got to experience that one. I have kind of looked at that one in PDF, and again, it kind of looks like D&D &D in space. Now, Adeptus Titanicus, I am a big fan um, I, the base game, I actually bought off a local gamer, Don Chisholm, and I have all his painted miniatures in it, which is kind of cool. And the game was okay, but then they put out Codex Titanicus, which was his expansion. And that added in all the rules for units, like uh, infantry and tanks. And that's when I got into it. And I still like the Titans, I use them, but I liked playing that whole epic Warhammer 40k, where you had massive armies, but didn't have to buy all the huge miniatures. Well, Justin Bueller commented, RPG-wise, back in the day, I ran a two-year weekly-running Inomine campaign. That game has an excellent theme with clunky mechanics. You played pretty loose in the mechanics. They tried translating it to GURPS, as the original system was essentially proto-GURPS. Okay. But, in my honest opinion, it became even clunkier with GURPS. Would Say love to so. see that game <laughs> get a remake. Got clunkier with GURPS, of course. Well, thanks, Justin. Justin's actually a local gamer. Uh, who I've actually, I've, I always forget he's into RPGs because I only ever play board games with him. He's, he recently moved here, um, recently being like in the last couple of years. Uh, man, I got to say though, like tonight, everyone so far, these RPGs mentioned, I haven't played myself. So cool enough. Thanks, Justin, for, for bringing up another one that, that I'm deficient in playing. Now, Steve Jackson Games, I got to say, is not well known for updating their game systems. So you can always hope. Now, I'm not sure about the Steve Jackson version, but this game was actually translated by Steve Jackson from a French version. Uh, and in doing so, apparently, they reduced the sort of humorous level of the game. Mm -hmm. Now, sadly, the original uh, closed its run in 2006 with a supplement, en Fanime. I'm closed. <laughs> yep. Now, after reading up of the original, it actually sounds like a really fun game. It would be a blast play they have separate players guides for demons and angels and essentially <laughs> it sounds like a biblical supers game interesting uh, but it's it, and it would literally complete with uh alter egos because you actually play uh mortals who are the uh alt the, the hidden side of of the angels and demons on earth <clears throat> not revealing themselves so it's that kevin smith movie you get to play out <laughs> i can't remember which one that was dogma dogma I mean, yes I thank you dogma Dogma, Dogma, the RPG. That's cool. I, to be honest, Steve Jackson game scares me. I, they, they make GURPS, right? And again, <laughs> uh, we're talking about crunchy simulationist style gaming, which is not something I ever dove very deep into. I don't hate all Steve Jackson games. Nothing, nothing. I'm not trying to say that. Just in general, his gaming style and my gaming style never really match. So that's, I never checked out a nominee, but it does sound cool. Maybe we can get Justin to run a game next time you're in Windsor and we'll set it up ahead of time. We do well, have just, to do another Extra Life event. 
I'm just wondering what Steve Jackson did differently from oh, the original French version. I know, I know some of the dice mechanics are the same, but content-wise, I'm not sure. Yeah, true. Now, again, this may be in print. The knowing Steve Jackson Games, I bet you can go to Warehouse 23, which is their store, and buy it right now. Because, again, Steve Jackson Games is notorious for not updating their games, but they're also notorious for never retiring them. And you can just always get them. Same with Fantasy Games Unlimited. Like, you can still buy Bushido and Space Opera. They still exist, which a lot of people seem to think they were only ever published in the 70s and 80s. But no, those companies are still around and still producing their games. They're just not talked about. Like, you're not going to see them on game stores. I think they basically probably print on demand nowadays. All right, well, finally, with Breakout Con coming up in less than three weeks, we republished our 2019 Breakout mm -hmm. Con wrap-up, where Mo tries to convince you all to, that this is the con you don't want to miss. We got a comment from Tara on that post. Could not agree more. So excited for this year's Breakout. Awesome. It is so close. We're so looking forward to it. I hope you see you there, Tara. Uh, if you catch any of us, be sure to come up and say hi. And to be honest, that goes for anyone who runs into us at Breakout or any of the other cons we attend throughout the year. Just please, please don't be offended if we don't remember your name or face. Um, for one, we do meet a lot of people. We're not famous, famous, but like we do meet a lot of people at cons and we're more recognizable than you are in some cases. But mostly, I'm just really terrible with names and I do not mean any offense by it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. And be sure to stick around after the main topic, because we do have some review material as well as a week in review where we talk about the games we played in the last week. So we are answering your question, but we continue on afterwards. So tonight from the chat, we're doing a game recommendation episode. So as usual, I want to know the games we missed. In this case, we already have some that you pointed out with previous similar topics, but I'm sure there are still some great two-player games out there that we're going to skip right over. Well, I can tell you right now, someone already beat us to the punch in the chat room. We didn't put Tic-Tac-Toe on our list. Yeah, I, you know, it did say quick and fast, not good <laughs> but in, the, in the question. We haven't there read the question yet, but yes. We're going to be talking about quick and fast two-player games. We're also going to be talking about quick, fast, good two-player games. And I also wore a very ironic shirt for tonight with one of the best two-player games. That was on purpose. I saw that in my closet. I'm like, oh, we're talking two-player games. But I got to wear my movies. Battleship shirt. Or uh, one of the, yeah, this is this is a retro shirt with the old ad from the magazines years ago. This was yeah. an, the ad for the original Battleship board game, which is the ultimate naval warfare. This is which, a scary concept. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I like about that movie is they found a way to integrate the pegs. That was the only thing. Once they did that, I'm like, okay, now you can say it's based on the board game. Yeah, no, it was it the, was a horrible stretch, and it was a bad movie. Oh, yeah. But they but integrated it. The, the they fact did. they integrated the pegs and at one point integrated the grid, I'm like, all right. Yeah, no, they... I, uh, I did not absolutely hate it. They fought tooth and nail to make that Battleship the movie. But aliens, why? Like... It's just, speaking of which, there is a really good version of Battleship out there that's not on our list because it's not easy. Although it's probably easier than some of the ones we mentioned. Maybe I should have put it on there. It's Battleship Galaxies, put out by Avalon Hill and Wizards of the Coast, designed by, like, war game designers, where you have different ships that are starships, and they have shields, and you can distribute energy, and it's really awesome, except it was obviously made to be a core set where they were going to release more armies for it, and never did. So it ends up being the same every time you play. Whereas like there were power cards and there was like um, captain cards and there was a card base system involved and where the G6 thing comes up is where you hit on the opponent's ship. Every ship has its own grid. And then of course you, you, you roll dice instead of picking, but you roll your dice and then look up on the grid. And if you hit part of the ship, you damaged it. And if you miss the ship's layout, you missed it. And it was actually a really good game. I've got it downstairs. I didn't get rid of it. But every game is the same. Like, you basically have the same armies. And, of course, it's it's an older game. Well, it's not older, but it's trying to recreate battleships. So both forces are not asymmetric. And there's only so many strategies you can try. And, like, it just it could have been awesome. But I think everyone saw it was like, ooh, battleship in space. Why do I want to? I have battleship, and I have Star Wars battleship, and I have electronic battleship. Why do I need a new one? And no one realized that this was actually, like, a, a Starfleet Battles extra light. 
There you go. That's an early extra bonus recommendation that's not on our list. Yeah, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up quickly on Board Game Geek just to see if it did belong on our list. I think it's too long for quick. And sorry if my typing is extra loud. It shouldn't be. Yeah, it came out 2011, and like I said, it was Avalon Hill and Wizards of the Coast. 70 minute playtime. So yeah, it didn't fit yeah, this year. Yeah. Didn't miss but like, like, look this up when you get a chance, just to see the ships. They come on stands. They have the pegs, but they peg into the base. The ships are very um, Battleship Yamato looking, anime looking. It's really cool game that just like it won best war game in 2011 for Golden Geek. They're nominated for best war game. Like that, it was solid. It just now it sells for 140 dollars because out of print. And it only it has a 6.6 .6 rating, but I bet you there's a whole bunch of people rating it like one or two because it's Battleship. Yeah. All right. I saw a bunch of stuff going by in the chat. What do we got in the chat besides tic tac toe? Anything else? Uh, people were wondering if they uh, Steve is doing uh, Steve Jackson is doing print on demand or if they actually have stockpile. I said knowing Steve Jackson, he probably has a big warehouse. Yeah. Like the the fact his store is called Warehouse Twenty Three is because he has a Warehouse Twenty Three. Interesting anecdote that I'm not going to get into here. It was raided by the FBI before. Yes. So you might want to look that up sometime. I'm yeah. not going to talk about That's a it fun here. Story. Yeah, but that's um, Warehouse 23 is what was yep. rated. Uh, we had some chatter early in the chat room about uh, the sadness of trains um, yeah. and, and potentially not taking trains up to uh, Breakout Con due to uh, price gouging. Yes. Not only, I just don't want to drive. The drive to Toronto sucks, as Sean knows many times. Even more so, driving downtown Toronto and paying for parking sucks. So I don't really want to do any of that. Oh, and there we go. We got Scatterbrains joining us in the chat room with a couple of couple of two-player games. All right. I am looking at Warehouse 23 right now, and almost everything says digital or book. Oh. So oh GURPS, digital or book, GURPS, digital or book. What was it? What is it in particular we were looking for? I forget now. Uh, in nominee. In nominee, yeah. Mane. I don't know how to spell it. N O M. I... GURPS and Nominee. So they put out a GURPS version. They did, the original yes. core rule book, only in digital right now. So it's not still in print. Yeah, it, it, it's... I mean, it's older. It's it's quite yeah. older. Because uh, it was 2006, 2003 when the GURPS one came out. And that was like the later version. Oh, interestingly, it was only put out in PDF. So they updated the rules. They put out 20 supplements. This is includes errata and rule clarifications of the 2000 second printing additional fixes so this is the 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 current printing of it which only ever put out as a pdf interesting which is interesting so and it's 17 bucks so there you go justin maybe you can go check out and see if they <laughs> fixed it because this came back after the gurps version so right. they put out a gurps version and then put out in nominee all right all right moving on We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to come through us is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got a question from Max Rokotensky, who asks, what's an easy but quick two-player game? Well, thanks for the question, Max. Uh, we get a lot of questions about two-player games. Like, seems playing in pairs is quite popular. It is, like, if we go through my list, this is not the only variant we haven't answered yet. And you know what? If that's what the people want, we can keep talking about two-player games as long as they're looking for something different, and I think they are here. The problem, though, is Max's question is rather vague, right? Because what's easy for one gamer can be seen as completely complex to another gamer especially when you're comparing gamers of different experience levels in regards to hobby games. Like, for example, I may think Race for the Galaxy is dead simple, but then I tried to teach Sean, who doesn't have all the experience with deck building, and it went rough. Or the first time we tried to teach Seven Wonders to someone who has never played a modern game newer than Monopoly, it did not go well. But myself, loving Food Chain Magnet and playing a couple, like playing an 18xx game, I was like, oh, Seven Wonders, you just draft cards, it's simple. So that's one thing. The other thing, too, is quick, too, right? To a chit and counter war gamer, a two-hour game could be considered a lightning-fast game. So due to the fact we can't know exactly what Max is looking for here, we're going to recommend a range of games, and we're going to split them up into categories. 
Now, to me, all of these are pretty easy and pretty quick, which for me means well under an hour and capping the difficulty at, say, patchwork level. All right, well, starting off with super quick games that are also mostly super simple to learn, listed in order of complexity as rated on Board Game Geek. I have to say, I don't <laughs> really agree with some of these difficulty ratings when I see them listed out this way in, you know, order of, of this form. But yeah, it is what it is. For, for information on what we mean by that, we do have a whole episode. I didn't grab the number ahead of time on weight and what that means in regards to board games. So check out that episode. We'll be sure to throw a, um, a link in the show notes to that episode. What it is, is the, the board game key scale rakes games from one to five on weight. And what weight means, we talk about in that episode, but it's a combination of things. It's not just how complex the rules are, it's how many decision points there are, how thick the rule book is, how easy is it to teach, and so on. And I gotta say, I completely agree with Sean. We talk about the weight of board game geek game all the time on here. We reference it often when we're doing our reviews, and we generally talk about it like it's a, a thing set in stone. But by God, when putting all these games in a list and seeing them next to each other and going, oh my God, there's no way that game's more complicated than that game, it's 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 almost like people are throwing darts at a dartboard sometimes. And episode 38 is our game weight. There you uh, go. Episode. Thank you. And Deanna has linked it in the chat. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So again, this is going to be the quickest, simplest game going up to a little more complicated. Now, these first games are super quick, like 15 minutes and under, like lightning quick games. These are the kind of games where you're probably going to play multiple rounds at once. These are great games for a, a lunch break or uh, possibly even a, a, a mid shift break or great filler games. Number one is, I'm going to start off with the dexterity game because I had to find one. Um, normally, I'd recommend Hamster Roll, but to be honest, it, yeah, it works two-player, but it's better with more. What I have here is Mackie Stack. This is from Blue Orange Games. It's a dead simple dexterity game, which has wooden pieces, which if you have kids, these look like Melissa and Doug quality pieces. And it's wooden pieces of sushi that my kids just want to play with. A really well-designed, nice pieces. You've got all these pieces of sushi and a tatami mat in front of you. You flip up a card and it shows this sushi stacked in some pattern. The first person to stack their physical sushi to match the card takes the card. And then I don't remember the number, but once a player collects so many cards, they win the game. Really quick, really fun, great, quick stacking dexterity game with some of the best components I've ever seen in a board game. But we're talking about dexterity games. So, but like this is playable. Like if you can get the game cheap enough, just buy a couple sets of it. Let your kids make play with wooden sushi. Once again, this is that was Mackie Stack. M-A-K-I stack. Yeah, Maki is in the type of sushi, the type of, which is the, the rolls. Uh, up next, the mind. You have a deck of cards numbered one to 100. You start with a hand to one card. You and your opponent now have to play your cards in numeric order. The trick is you can't communicate with each other. If you do get through level one, try level two with two hands, two cards in your hand. Then level three with three cards. If you can get up to level 10, you've done better than I've ever done. Now, there is a tiny bit more to it where when you win a round, you get throwing stars and there's a way you can both put your hands up. But the basic thing is play your cards in order without actually communicating about it. I, some people consider it not a game. I think it's a game. I actually think it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, it, it's one of those games where you want to slap your head because it's so simple. And you're like, man, how could no one have come up with this before? Uh, that's by Pandasaurus Games. Well worth picking up. Excellent two-player and more. That was The Mind. Now, here's one that Sean and I played um, and surprised me. It is Ticket to Ride New York. Now, you don't, you might think a Ticket to Ride is easy, but not quick. Well, Ticket to Ride New York is the quick version. It's a lightning quick version of Ticket to Ride that is as good, if not almost more fun than the original because it's so lightning quick. Everything Ticket to Ride, but small box and about 50 minute game time. We played this on my birthday for the first time. We both enjoyed it a lot, and I was surprised by how much I liked it. Yeah, I'm not a huge Ticket to Ride fan, but Ticket to Ride New York was kind of Ticket to Ride in that in that small enough time frame that I wasn't bored and sick of the game yeah. by the time it was over. So that's Ticket to Ride New York. Uh, and I believe there's another a couple of other smaller versions as well, are there not? Is uh, there's now a Ticket to Ride London. Yeah, London. London is the, is the EU map. And I, as far as I know, they're sold in different areas. Like, I don't know if London's even available here. But yeah, London is a different map and another quick playing. And again, this does play more than two. So I think it plays up to four players. Uh, up next, a word game, Bananagrams. This is a simple crossword style word game that's kind of like Scrabble without all the complicated scoring or the board. 
There are a bunch of different versions of this one out here. We've mentioned it on the podcast before. The one I've noted is they've now put out Bananagram's Duel, which is specifically made for two players. Now, I can't strongly recommend that because I haven't tried it myself, but the fact Bananagram's is good, I can't see how a two-player version would be bad. And then that's Bananagram's or Bananagram's Duel. Another word game, Boggle, one of my wife's favorites, a dead simple word game. This is probably the quickest game on the entire list because literally a long round of Boggle, actual playing is three minutes. And then while well, you're just comparing your words after. So total play time of maybe 10 minutes. Uh, shake up the letters, spell as many words as you can, but don't score anything that your partner also writes down. Simple game that I got to say, like, I, I'm not a huge mass market proponent, but this is as good as many hobby board games. Like, it just solid concept that was created years ago and it's still fun. And I, this is where this is where the board game geek scores start getting weird. How is Boggle more difficult than Ticket to Ride New York? I don't really know. But you, you have to be able to spell. It's language dependent. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But that was know. Boggle. Yeah, Boggle at a weight of 1.5 somehow. Yeah, we're we're these are these are not my rating scales. I, maybe I should have listened to the weights. I think, yeah, yeah Boggle probably or Boggle versus Bananagrams. Like you got to rearrange the letters in Bananagrams. Yeah, anyway, I don't know. Uh, up next, uh, getting back to the hobby board games is Onitama, a perfect information abstract strategy game with a martial arts theme. Try to defeat all of the fighters in the opponent's dojo, or get your sensei to the opposing side's temple. Uh, the brilliant part about this game is that once you use a movement card to move one of your pieces, you have to give it to your opponent, and then they're going to use it against you. And that is Onitama. Now, for some slightly longer games, but should still be well under half an hour. Yeah. We start with King Domino, a deceptively simple domino-based area majority game. Draft kingdom tiles with up to two terrain types on them. Place them into your kingdom board, trying to make large touching areas of matching terrain. Uh, this one features a lot of heat drafting with two players. And personally, I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, no, King Domino is just great. And and again, it's easy. Uh, this one is actually rated easier than both uh, Ticket to Ride and Boggle on Board Game Geek. And it really is quite an easy game. Yeah. The only thing a little, like the scoring is is the only like the actual gameplay is dead simple like yeah. it you're matching dominoes you have to put <laughs> matching terrain next to each other come on yep. but yeah the the scoring it still it involves multiplication so therefore it's more complicated yeah. than boggle perhaps but that was king domino all right next i have the game the worst named game in the entire world because try googling the game or go shopping for it and trying it on walmart search Despite the fact I hate the game, this is a really solid cooperative card game. I personally now consider it a more complicated version of The Mind, though it did come out first. Uh, you as players trying to play through a hand of cards, starting off with six, by building four stacks of numbers, two of which are counting up and two of which are counting down, and you have to play in order again. So if I play a 67, I have to play something lower in the one pile, or if it's in the other pile, I have to play higher. The goal is to play every card in the game. Uh, the neat trick is if you play a card that's exactly 10 off from the last card play, you get to break the rule and go the other way. Uh, trust me, it sounds more complicated than it is. If, you, if I had the cards in front of me and showing these to you, you get it right away. This game is way more fun than it should be. Like every time I break it out, I'm like, hey, do you want to play the game? Let's play the game. We're like, oh man, I forgot how good the game is. Now, this is not like the mind in the fact that you can communicate during this one. So this is a lot more social than the mind. And that game was the game. Yes, just to and make you things just, difficult. Yes. And for all you millennials out there, you just lost the game. Next, I have Hey, That's My Fish. Uh, don't dismiss this as a kid's game. It looks like a kid's game. Yes, my kids can play it, but it not actually marketed as one. You lay out a bunch of ice flow uh, hex tiles, like the pieces of ice, on which there are one, two, or three fish. You then place your penguins out on the map you've made, Every turn, you're going to move one of your penguins, and it has to follow a straight line along the hexes, and you pick up the tile they were on. So as you play, the board starts to disappear, and moves get harder and harder, and eventually people get cut off. End of the game, you just add up how many fish you collected. Straightforward. Fish, penguins, and ice. That's, <laughs> hey, that's my fish. All right, if you want a beautiful game, if, this, if you play in public, and you're playing two-player games at public, and you're looking to get other gamers to join in, Bring out Santorini. This is a game that is going to catch people's attention. 
This is a city building game based on the famous city in Greece with the, the white buildings with the blue domes and involves a bunch of plastic pieces and you have these little worker pieces and you move a worker and then you get to build a level of the building. And the goal is you can also step up one level at a time is to build up your building so that you get one of your two workers up on top of the third floor. It's uh, deceptively simple, but complex. It's got that chess feel, that abstract strategy, perfect information style game. And then interestingly, Santorini also throws in God cards, all using the Greek gods that give everyone special powers. And by throwing those in, it ups the interaction of the difficulty. Like you'll have something like Thor can smash. Not Thor. There's obviously no Thor in the Greek. I mix in my... You have I, Ares. Sorry, it's Ares. Ares can smash a building, right? And then you remove one. And Zeus can shoot lightning bolts that causes people to move and so on. Very neat, very quick, uh, beautiful looking game. Like this is this is a, almost an heirloom game. There are a lot of people out there who have painted their copies. There's people who have done light up versions. Really great looking game. So that is Santorini. And if you've ever seen a picture of a beautiful Grecian uh, city work slowly building itself up the mountain with white yeah. buildings, you've seen pictures of Santorini because they're yeah, all the same city. They are. It's, it's that classical, you know, mm -hmm. this is what a Greek paradise looks like sort of picture. Yep. That's Santorini. All right, another mass market favorite. Blockus. We've talked about this one many times. This is one of the few four-player games that has a two-player variant that I actually like. And all it is with Blockus is you play two of the colors, and it works extremely well in Blockus. Each turn, you're going to alternate which color you're playing. Goal here is to play as many of your... I, I, I don't know if they're polyominoes. They're unique type of things. You want to play as many of your tiles in both colors. Whoever has the least tiles left after no more plays are available wins the game. Dead simple mass-market game that I think is fantastic. Absolutely, and that is Blockus. Uh, it's sort of like a a a, a flat uh, Scrabble version of um uh, uh not Tet Tetris. Tetris, not Jenga. Tetris. Yeah, except <laughs> in this one, the blocks don't touch because the yeah. the rule is you have to put it on a corner of one of your existing pieces, and you can't touch your own pieces, which is kind of unique. But piece wise, or blow who some yeah. people call it. Yeah, piece wise, it's definitely got that Tetris look. And that was Blockus. Or blow coup, as some people like to call it. The same people uh, who call Target Target. Yes, probably. <laughs> Up next, this is the the hidden gem. This is the one no one's heard of. I want. I like to. I'm going to start doing this more, where I slip in the one the one game you probably never heard of that I think is worth checking out. And this is a game called Resistor. Uh, I got this one off Kickstarter. Um, it's now put out by Level Ninety Nine Games. At the time, it was kickstarted by an independent uh, husband and wife pair that put the game out. Uh, this is. A really neat game about two warring supercomputers during the Cold War. And you have Deep Blue and, and like, uh, something red. I forget. It's obviously a U.S.-Russian uh, thing. It's actually Deep Red or and uh, Blue 9000. Oh, there you go. That's uh, I get in a mix-up. But, yeah, two supercomputers. And what it is, you have a hand of cards that are showing kind of circuits. And the neat part is the cards are two-sided. And you have to hold them up so your opponent can see the back of your cards. And then you're going to take actions to put cards on the table. And one of the neat actions, is you can flip the cards. So you're trying to remember what's on the back of each of the cards. And you're trying to make a complete circuit between the two CPUs. And when you do that, you damage the other CPU. And then every time a CPU is damaged, the circuit gets shorter. So it gets a little tighter every time. And the first person to knock out the opponent's CPU wins. This is a really neat two-player card game. With a, it even has like a unique box where the cards send, stand up a unique way so you can see half of them. Uh, it's well worth checking out. I don't know how readily available this one is. Um, I got it, like I said, off the Kickstarter. But there is my hidden gem for this list, Resistor. All right, well, that was Resistor. All right, Hive. This is one that's on every one of my lists. Uh, this is the one I'm going to disagree with the time, the, the, the time on this one. I've never had a game of Hive go 20 minutes, but you know what? I went with the Board Game Geek Times. Uh, this one you're trying to surround the opponent's queen bee using hex-based Bakelite tiles. And you're going to either lay a tile or move a tile. And the neat part in this is each of the tiles feature different bugs, and each bug moves different. And it's based on building the hive. So, like, ants can only go around the outside of the edge. The grasshoppers can hop over it. The ladybug can climb on top. I am a long-term fan of hive. Uh, for years now, if someone said, what's your favorite two-player game? I'd say hive. It was only... Well, recently being um, subjective, replaced by the Duke for me is my go-to two-player game when playing with my wife. Uh, and people might want to look up at the Hive Pocket, 
which is a newer release, uh, you know, a slightly smaller version that uh, easy for travel. Yeah, and there's also Hive Carbon, which comes with two of the expansions, not all three, but as two of them, it has the mosquito and the pill bug. It doesn't have the ladybug, or it has the ladybug and not the pill bug. I can't uh, remember. Well, Hive Hive Pocket actually uh, includes mosquito and ladybug as well. So yeah, it's still missing the pill bug, which is newer. So I don't know. I'm assuming there's probably a pocket version of the pill bug, but basically, I would just look up whichever one's cheaper and go with that. Uh, I don't know how small the pocket ones are. I have the full size, and they're they're not big. Uh, they're they're. Quite small. I'm trying to find a picture that actually shows. A like real... I actually think it'd be too fiddly, to be honest. Uh, like for, for my. They're about. Fingers. They're about the size of like the tip of my thumb, sort of. Well, that's not too bad. So they're about probably about half the size of the, the the ones maybe. Not. I mean, not super small, but they're not. Yeah. Coin, they're they're coin size. You know, a little. You know. That's not too bad then. Yeah, this one it comes in like a zippered bag, so you just like my wife used to throw it in her purse yep. when we'd be going out to the coffee shop or whatever. This is one of those games where you look on Board Game Geek and there are pictures of people playing the game all over the place. Like people are people are really proud of where they have played Hive. Yes, yes. Some some of my favorite are like in um uh, at the coral reef scuba diving because yeah. they're Bakelite tiles, so they are waterproof. Yep. And that was Hive. Now these ones are going to take about a half an hour. All right. So now I don't know if we're still in the quick thing, but like I said, for some people. Half an hour is nice and quick. So number one is Lost Cities. Uh, this is one of the best two-player card games out there. This is a uh, Rainier Nitzia classic. If you dig a bit of push your luck and some card counting and really having to watch what your opponent is doing in a game, where almost more of the game is trying to figure out what they're doing as much as what you're doing on your own, you're probably going to dig Lost Cities. I really like it. The thing is, there are multiple versions of this out. You want the original card game because sadly the later release versions so far just do not live up to the, the enjoyment we've had with the original game. All right. And that was Lost Cities. And I just want to take a brief pause here to say that in less than 30 seconds, Gorinto will have backed with a massive overage compared to their goal on That is awesome. You know what? That should be on our list. Gorinto probably should be on here. It was really good two players. <laughs> Technically, it's not released yet. It's still got another 12 seconds yes. to go. There you go. But yeah, here, there's our honorable mention. Oh, we have some of those later. Our not yet published game, Gorinto. I'm going to say half hour to 45 minutes. So it actually belongs, belongs in our next category. It played it's been really fun. good at two players. The fireworks are going off on the screen right now. Excellent. Congratulations, Grand Gamers Guild and Mark Spector. Big fan of that game. I will be doing demos of Gorinto on Friday and Saturday at noon at Breakout Con. Though it is a scheduled event, so you want to get onto Sketch and schedule, like, sign up. Though it's not there yet, so it will be <laughs> on Sketch. Of course, yeah, that's, uh, well. Yeah. All right, sorry to interrupt. Moving on, next up, we have... Next up, we have Patchwork. Build a quilt by drafting polyomino tiles in different fabrics, with and without buttons on them. Each tile takes time to build, and as time goes on, you earn buttons based on how many are already on your kilt, which are going to let you buy bigger tiles, but are also your points at the end of the game. Uh, that's probably the most succinct way I can explain this game without seeing it. Uh, this is one of the best two-player games I own. My wife and I love this game. This is This would replace the Duke. The only problem with it is it takes up a lot of room. You have to put a ring of tiles around the board, and that just doesn't fit on most coffee shops. But if we're playing at home, this is a great game. And there is, I have not tried it, but they have released a Patchwork Express, which supposedly makes it even quicker. Now, it's already only a half-hour game, so I don't know how quick you want your games of Patchwork to be, but the Express version is smaller as well. So I haven't tried that one, so that's a, a take it with a grain of salt, but that may fix the problem with taking up so much room. And uh, just to clarify, that is quilts, not kilts. Did I say kilts? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Quilts, yes. <laughs> and that was uh, Patchwork. I was thinking about our later review. There you go. All right. Up next, Azul. Uh, we haven't gone on about this one as much as we had in the past, but this is an excellent abstract tile laying game that literally blew me away when it first came out. Became one of my most played games ever. Like, not just my most played game in 2018, but one of my most played games of all time. A uh, lot of those plays were two players, my wife and I, and other people just playing two players. Game is nice and compact at two, which is what 
I, why it got so many plays because you just need the two boards in the center market. And we played on coffee tables. It's great at a bar or, you know, like you go to a lunch place and they have the window seating up at the window where you just have that narrow ledge. It's great for that. And now that there are three versions of Azul, this is definitely the simplest and easiest to learn of the Azul games. Absolutely. Uh, well, they're all, they're all good in their own ways. Uh, and I think we're starting to lean towards the newest one as our new favorite. This is still the the beginner and the and the the one that that stands out as quick and easy, and doesn't take up a lot of space either. So that yep. is Azul. All right, Splendor, uh, Splendor and Azul like to get grouped together. Well, they are really close in weight and time on Board Game Geek. So this is one of the easiest to learn building games out there, engine building games, where you're slowly building up your engine to to score victory points. You're going to collect gems that are represented by poker chips. Which, man, if you can get the original printing, those poker chips are nice. That's what I've got, thankfully. You're going to use those poker chips to buy merchants. These merchants act as permanent gems, basically making it easier to buy even more merchants and eventually buying merchants worth points and leading to being able to buy nobles, which are worth even more points. The whole game is a race to 15 points. First person there wins. Plays just as well with two players as it does with four. All you got to do is remove some of the gems at the beginning of the game. That was Blender. All right, Star Realms is one of my favorite deck builders that ever come out, and I'm a big deck builder fan, one of the best ever made, and it plays best at two players. This was one of the first variable card market deck building games where what you can buy every round changes instead of having a standard market like in Dominion. And it's still one of the best variable market games out there. And it was also the first game to use the combo where if I play two cards of the same color, I get some kind of bonus. One of the biggest things that this belongs on this list so badly for is that one deck, which costs you like 15 bucks, is enough to play with two people forever. Now, there are a variety of expansions out there, and there are different starter decks, and yes, you can combine them, but you just need one, and that's it. Now, if you do prefer fantasy themes to sci-fi themes, there is also Hero Realms, which is a very similar version of the game. But I do hear that if you really want to enjoy Hero Realms, you want to pick up a separate hero deck which adds some specific cards to make the game asymmetric. I will admit fully, I have not played Hero Realms. I've only played Star Realms. All right. And that was Star Realms and or Hero Realms. Next is Star Wars Destiny. This is a combination of collectible card game and dice game set in the Star Wars universe, put out by Fantasy Flight Games. You're going to build your force through pregame, right? So it's not deck building like the others, deck construction, where you're going to build a deck before you play. You're going to play heroes versus villains, um, light versus dark. You get to mix and match over all of the movies, um, as well as some of the, the TV series. Some of the cards, mainly your heroes, and some of your special abilities are represented by dice. And what's neat there is what they basically do is make it so that your cards have random abilities. So Han Solo could smuggle you goods and get you money one turn, or he could attack with his blaster, or he could give you rerolls. It's it's really neat the way this is. It, it's been designed. Like I, I, I'm not usually a huge fan of dice games, and it's really well done in this one. The whole goal here, though, is to wipe out the opponent's force. You have to kill their heroes before they kill yours. What I actually recommend here is there is a two-player starter set that is fantastic. It's set in the um, the new movies, The Force Awakens time period, with you know Ray and Darth Maul. My oldest daughter and I have had a ton of fun just playing with that. Now, unfortunately, the game is now discontinued. So if you are interested in picking it up, now's the time. Like, you can get 32-pack um, booster boxes on Amazon for 20 bucks right now. $19.99 for some of the booster packs. So, like, pick up that two-player starter set. Pick up a couple booster boxes. You'll be good to go. Just because the game's dead doesn't mean you can't play it. And it's interesting. It is still listed on their website. So... They're, they're still selling it on, uh, yeah, on the Fantasy Flight Games website. They're it, just it's, not making it's, any new content. Yes, they're, they're done supporting it. But it, what they're, they'll sell through whatever stock they have left. And that was Star Wars Destiny. Now, how that is lighter than Azul, I have no idea. But up next, we have Azul Summer Pavilion, which Sean kind of hinted at earlier. This is the newest version of Azul with diamond-shaped tiles that I think is just as good as the original but does have slightly more complicated scoring rules, which does give it more weight. It also requires an additional play board, so it needs more room than the base Azul. So it's not as great for, say, date night or going to the coffee shop, but if you're playing at home, it's great. What I also think may make this a better choice for some people is that I find it's less cutthroat. 
especially with two players, because there's less opportunity for hate drafting or sticking someone with a bunch of negative points. So I think this may appeal to gamers that are less competitive, who just want to focus on building their own thing. Absolutely. I definitely think that this is, I mean, while I, I suppose it could become more cutthroat, uh, it's easier to play without being deliberately cutthroat and, and, and being cruel. And it is definitely a fun, uh, yeah. Fun well, play. you can't, you can't do the thing where you make the person draft the first player tile and take 15. Like that's gone sure. from yeah. the game yeah. completely. There's that. And plus with the, be able to get the bonus tiles on the edge, it's really hard to just say, I'll deny you red because there's always other ways to get it. I find it definitely less cutthroat. Even if you want, you can kind of hate draft, but it's definitely not as bad. And that was Azul's Summer Pavilion. All right, just a couple more at this level. We have War Chest. Now, this one, I, it, it, I wasn't sure if I want to keep this on here for easy, because this definitely has more of a learning curve than any of the other games listed so far, but it's an excellent abstract war game that uses poker-style chips, really nice weighted poker-style chips. Each player is going to get four random unit types and a bunch of chips for those units. They're going to throw a bunch of those in a bag, and every turn you're going to pull out three chips. And they're going to use those chips to play, maneuver, and attack with the units on the board. You win by controlling different set objective spots on the map. Uh, that's the really short overview. I was blown away by War Chest the first time I played it. This is one for me that this and the Duke kind of switch between what I want to play next. Like they're they're on the same level with that same abstract war game feel. And I really enjoy this one. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like I could teach my son War Chest before I could teach him Azul. Yeah. <laughs> So, it's possible. It's an interesting, it's an interesting the way the weight uh, falls out. But again, this is War Chest. Then the Duke, we've mentioned it like three times on the episode without actually getting to it. Uh, this is another one that's definitely on the cusp of what I would call easy, especially with some of the player, the, the powers, the various powers on the different things and knowing what the different symbols mean is a bit of a learning curve. But you know what? If you can learn the moves for a bunch of chess pieces, you can learn the moves for the Duke. And the cool part is you don't have to remember anything because all the moves are right on the pieces, which are two-sided tiles. And the neat bit is after you move a tile, you have to flip it over and it'll have a different set of moves on the other side. And that's the brilliance of the Duke. There's some bag building involved in it. There is a fantastic two-player game. Uh, it's it's up there for one of my favorite of all time. Yeah, and I mean, my 10-year-old son and I play this in the morning before school. It is, it is and as long as, you, again, depending on which uh, pieces you include, it is quick and easy. So. Finally, uh, and that was the Duke. Finally, we move on to games that there's a good chance will take you more than half an hour, which should be done in well under an hour. Yeah, these are these are games that are basically going to be based on the amount of AP. So how much time players take to determine when to make their moves, because these are games that are going to require a little more decision, have a bit more decision points in them. Now, the first one is another mass market game, the dead most simple of the bunch, and that is Quirkle. Uh, this is a tile lading and pattern matching game that a lot of people compare to Scrabble. So it's shape Scrabble, I've heard it called before. You're trying to make rows and columns of either tiles with all the same shape or all the same color, but not both. Uh, if you get all six colors or all six shapes in a line, you get a quirkle and you get bonus points. Uh, and the rest of it's Scrabble style scoring, where you're, if you put a tile on, you're going to score across and down. I would play this over Scrabble any day. I am a big fan of quirkle. We play this with both my kids. And this is a great one. And again, that's quirkle. Next, we have Sagrada. Uh, this is a dice drafting stained glass window building game that is pretty much different every time you play it due to having randomized starting patterns for your windows and randomized tools, which are things that you can use during the game to break the rules. Now, in general, you're drafting D6 dice in different colors and putting them onto a grid pattern. And the rule is you can't have two of the same number or two of the same color next to each other. This is a great puzzly drafting game that reminds me of games like Azul and um, uh, Santorini, which I mentioned earlier. Again, that is the Grotta. Another one that Deanna and I play with our kids is Ingenious. This is another classic Rainier Nitzia tile laying game that has hex shaped almost domino-like tiles because each tile is two hexes and will feature one or two different shapes and colors. Now, there aren't different shapes and colors like every square is the same color and every circle is the same color. It's just there for people with color blindness or people to recognize clearly. Uh, the What this game does is points are scored by making lines of the same shape and color on the board. 
following the various radiuses off a of hex. Uh, the neat part here is that it has the Nizia classic scoring method of only your weakest color or shape scores points at the end of the game, which is just brilliant when playing this game. So you have to balance what you're doing. And again, that is ingenious. Next, we have Carcassonne. Uh, this is one that everyone's two-player list out there. It's going to be on there. This is a classic tile laying game. What I love about it, two players, it is so cutthroat. It is actually, two, I prefer to play Carcassonne two players. I find it best at two players because of this cutthroat nature. Like, man, watch those farms in those big cities. It's all about trying to steal the farms, steal the cities, now and then stealing the roads, but that's kind of minor. Um, it's worth noting, though, again, bringing up here Nizia, there is a two-player specific version of Carcassonne called The Castle. Now, I own that. It's solid. It's still a tile lane game, and it's got the roads with different zones on it, but it's very different from the original, and that one, to me, is a, a try before you buy because it's so different, but it is even more competitive and close and cutthroat than original Carcassonne. It is definitely not for everyone because of that. It's also very out of print. And uh, so that was Carcassonne and Carcassonne the Castle. Also, do be aware that the digital versions of Carc are really phenomenal. Although, yes. depending on how you play and who you're playing with, may not be quite as quick. Yeah, again, that's, that's the biggest thing with the games in this group, I find, is, again, AP. All right, our final game for the night recommended by the Bellhop team is Seven Wonders Duel. Uh, this is another one that's it's just breaching the what I consider easy. Um, Seven Wonders is huge. Uh, everyone loves Seven Wonders. It is great at five at high player counts. How many games out there that are fairly solid Euros play with seven players, right? But you know what? It stinks at two. And Anton Bowza, I think, knew this because he teamed up with Bruno Cathala to create Seven Wonders Duel. Now, this game isn't just designed for two players, but plays extremely well at two players. I will play Seven Wonders Duel over Seven Wonders every day. Like, I almost wish the next time I have six gamers together, I had three copies of Seven Wonders Duel. So when someone says, let's play Seven Wonders, I go, yes, and pull this out instead. Because I would much rather play Seven Wonders Duel. It does some really neat stuff to... to Get rid of the drafting using pyramid cards where you have to take, I, I think that's what you call it when you set out cards in a pyramid. And once you remove the top card, the next two are available. It uses that for the drafting mechanism, which was just brilliant. You're still tracking warfare. You're still building wonders. You're still tracking resources. Has all the feel of seven wonders in 30 minutes and plays two players really tight. There we go. That is seven wonders duel, not seven wonders. Yes. Now we've got some honorable mentions. These are games that our fans have recommended over various podcast episodes and articles. Now, I haven't played any of these myself, but I thought it was worth mentioning. As I said before, we've covered various different forms of two-player game topics over the last two years since this podcast has been going. And over the years, there's a few games that people keep recommending every time we do one. So we wanted to make sure to get these out here for people to check out, even if we haven't necessarily had a chance to try them ourselves. Uh, up first is Farkle. I will admit I have played Farco, but only on an app version on Facebook, and it was all right. Uh, to me, it was a better Yahtzee. This is a dice game. Anyone can play with the dice you have on hand. You can Google the rules. You don't even have to go spend any money. I'm sure someone has. Everyone has. I think it's 5D6 is all you need. That was uh, Farco, again, with a dice you've got. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Uh, Mr. Jack. One player plays Jack the Ripper. The other player tries to catch Jack. That's pretty much the sum up for that one. Next up, we have Mystery Rummy, Jack the Ripper. I got to admit, the first time this was re recommended, I was totally confused because I thought there were two separate games and I thought someone was recommending Mr. Jack. But I guess this uses the standard Rummy mechanics, but then tosses a theme on top of it with a mystery theme. Now, I'm personally a little confused with this and letters from Whitechapel. What's with all the Jack the Ripper board games? Like, like is that the zombie thing from a few years ago? I Apparently, there are a lot of Jack the Ripper fans out there. If you're going to do a mystery, I guess it's in the public domain. So, I guess. Jack the Ripper on it. I guess. I thought it was odd. Uh, next, I've got Archaeology the Card Game. Uh, discover the treasures of Egypt with two to four player games that our fans assure us is great with two. And then, <clears throat> then Ramen Fury. This is the newest game on the list, just released last year in 2019. This is a ramen-making, card-comboing, take-that-card game. 
that I just feel we should pick up at some point just to have a copy of. So we seem to talk about ramen so much. Yeah. Just, just based on theme alone, whether it's a good yes. game or not, ramen fury. We got to figure out if, if it plays under 50 minutes, we could probably get in a game while waiting for ramen at yeah. Eros at some point. So we had to pick up a copy of that. And our last game of the night is battle line. Now this one is on every best two player list out there on the web. We've had multiple comments over the last couple of years from fans that love it. I hate to say it, but this one fell flat for Deanna and I. Like, we tried it, and it just did not go over well. But you know what? I get this one recommended so often. I'm wondering if, like, we missed something. So I'm thinking at some point, Deanna and I have got to try Battle Line for a second time and see if, like, I don't know, we tried it early in our board gaming career and we did no better, or I don't know. It was, was never one for us. Maybe we should give it another shot. But Battle Line strongly recommended by a number of people that's from GMT games. This is the one the war gamers like the quick and easy Roman battles using cards. Well, now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, we're going to head over to the lobby and see what they think. I noticed uh, Red Meeple Ryan was wishing his uh, plays of Seven Wonders Duel were as, uh, as fast as that, where he's been playing closer to 90 minutes. Oof. His plays. Yeah, I get it. the half an hour is what board game he said, but I threw it in the more than half an hour because any time I played, it was 45 minutes to an hour. I don't think we ever hit 90 minutes. Again, it's it's a lot of those last games have a lot of decision points. So it's a lot of thinking and a lot of deciding what to do in AP, right? So yep. that's going to slow down any of these. I've had a game of Santorini take almost 20 minutes because of AP. Uh, All right. What other recommendations did we have? Did we have any? I see uh, the As Asmodee Kark you recommend over um, Board Game Arena's version. Yeah, if you can. I mean, it's it, it's got the price that uh, where the where the Board Game Arena version doesn't, but yeah. they have really implemented Kark so well those digital versions. But the first game I ever bought for Xbox Live was Carcassonne, and it is really well done with sound yeah. effects and water, and it had the river involved and some of the other bonuses. That's actually where I learned to play well two player because my God, the the probably kids swearing at me and calling me nasty names and my they always sound like twelve year olds. I don't know if they actually are. We're so dang good at Kark, and I thought I was a good <laughs> Kark player until playing them. One of the one of the really nice features you can turn on and off in that digital version is uh, you can actually it will it will give you a a, sh a shading if there is a card remaining that is able to fit into a oh. square. <laughs> So, so you don't have moves. to memorize yep. the, the deck and, and, and you know, keep track of, of what uh, has and hasn't been. There you go. Anecdote time. Maybe I should save this for the coffee shop. Yeah, I'm going to save this for the coffee break. That, this, this one's going to be for patrons only. Remind me to, to, to tell a, a Kark story later. All right. Uh, but yeah, that's a level of Kark I never got to, is, is the memorizing how many of, yes, there's only two cloisters with Run Road coming out of them. There are a couple tiles, I know. Like, the, there's certain ones that are rare that I definitely know there are only so many of them in there, but I've definitely not memorized all of them. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I look at the, you know, I play it, I play it regularly. I play it, I've always got a game going on, and I, I know what cards are available, but I can't possibly keep track, especially on the longer BGA games where, well, just, yeah. you know, a couple of weeks go by and was your... Well, I guess technically playing. you could look at the board and see what's out there. Yeah. Uh, I see uh, Scatterbrains. Thank you for joining us. Not a name I recognize. Welcome to our chat room, assuming you're still there. Looks like uh, Scatterbrain wants a heavy, best heavy two-player games, which Deanna has also requested. So someone send in an official question. So, yeah, it's Hammer of the Scots. It's a fantastic two-player game, but that's definitely a game weight problem and not quick. And Twilight Struggle, same thing. When we played Twilight Struggle, was one of the few games we split over two week at two nights. Uh, and uh, they're actually their first suggestion was actually a few acres of snow, which is uh, it's, uh, still a little on the longer yeah, side. That's a it's a Martin Wallace uh, deck building game, which is basically you're taking a heavy economic gamer who made a war game, which is interesting. I have the fantasy version, Mythotopia, and you know what? It's it's one of those games that was a one and done and shouldn't have been. Like, I played it and went, this is really neat, but I'm trying to play through games of my pile of shame, and I always meant to go back to it, and I never did. So I don't think that's saying a bad thing about the game, but it is in a way. I need to play it more. I, I do remember liking it. I didn't see a lot of other quick ones. There's no way we... I keep feeling like I'm forgetting 
some really dead simple quick like card games right. like deanna and i spent this morning talking about it going what are we missing like uh one of like some of the ones on the miss list were, were those games like uh hey that's our fish as soon as i thought i'm like yes hey that's yeah. my fish definitely yeah, but I'm like, like, I just feel like, 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 like Uno, but like not Uno. Uno is not good two players, but like, I feel like I'm missing a whole group of games. But even when I Googled it, I wasn't finding anything. Yeah. Like the, the DC deck builder games, you can do a lot of those shorter, but it usually remain, uh, involves like taking out a bunch of villains. So yeah, you can, but it's not as fun because you're not getting as much game yeah. in there. It's really designed for, for you know, having a, a good mm -hmm. stack of villains there. You just throw in throw in two villains it's kind of not as fun a game yeah, you don't you don't get this. you don't get the combos built up you don't get your deck really developed in such a short game yeah there's definitely like like there's all the lookout game two player series but none of those are quick or easy so i'm like they're great yeah well patchwork's part of that but like i said patchwork was kind of my upper limit that's it's not a quick game to teach the first time yeah i uh, guess i guess we're not missing anything it just it feels like it like i just feel like like there's one that uh, our local game store recommended called Babylon, which was this game that only has three different colors of rocks and is dead simple. It's like on your turn, you can place one rock or two rocks. And it basically reminds me of the game you used to play as a kid where you had the, the baseball bat and you could either put like two fingers or you could grab it and the person on top wins. It was kind of that. It was it was the do you play one or two or one or two and the person with the rock on the top wins. Like it was good, but it wasn't great. Like I, it's not as good as any of the games on the list tonight. Like I, I just feel like we're missing a, a, I don't know, a mass market glut of two-player games. Yeah, like there's well, Battleship, obviously, but that's not honestly a good game, in my opinion. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, even my my son doesn't even really like. We, we've got a Star Wars Battleship, and it's like, yeah, you can throw it out and play it, but really that fun. Uh, yeah, I have to say, Battleship has got to be better without the setup time. Like, I think the digital battle ga Battleship version games like uh, have to be better because. Yeah. Setting up and, and placing and, and doing things is really the hardest part and the most annoying part about Battleship. Connect Four, there, there's one. That's not a terrible game when you play with people who know what they're doing. That's true. I and mean, there are variants out there. Like there's the the best way to play Connect Four I've heard is you literally play blind. So you you either blind well you don't blindfold yourself, but you put a piece of cardboard in front of the plastic thing so you can't actually see. So you have to remember, and then you have at the end reveal and see who won. Right. There we go. Brian Ryan says, add donut stickers to the pieces and it suddenly gets way better. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I'm sure that there's yeah. tic tac toe is not one. There are tic tac toe variants that are supposed to be really good. Raptor and Minara. There, I've heard of those. Okay. Hey, Thirsty Mogwai, welcome to the chat. I've heard Raptor's really good. That's two players where one player plays a Raptor trying to eat the people and someone else has playing the others. I I didn't enjoy any of the Princess Brides games I played. Now I don't know if I played I Hate to Kill You. I got a bunch of them for one of our extra life auctions and we played them all as demos and I didn't feel the need to try to keep any of them. All right, I think we're good to All right. Well, I mean Waterworks again, Waterworks is one we could have done. Yeah, Waterworks is all right. Millborn was is pretty good. Yeah. But I yeah. think it's better with more than two. Uh, I don't know. It's it just, it's just something is like, man, I feel like I'm missing this glut of two players, simple, quick two player games that play in like 10 minutes. What about that uh, Monopoly deck? Uh, uh, yeah, I was game. asking about that. I've never played Monopoly Duel. I've heard Monopoly Deal. Sorry, Monopoly Deal is real good, but I don't know if it plays two player. Right. All right. And quick, quick, easy, do not fit the words RPG to me. So we did not talk about any <laughs> RPGs because I, I can't see a 50 minute RPG being all that. A, interesting rory story cubes yeah that'd be I mean, about, at that know, point like you're, playing those bold, yeah. you're playing improv games more than than an yeah. actual rpg really there, there are a bunch of improv games that i think would probably fit that but i don't think there's any like pen and paper rpgs that you go out and buy there's probably some 200 word rpgs that you play in 15 minutes or something but that was not for tonight's topic we stuck to i didn't even use the rpg maitre d in in the uh intro this time all righty all right let's move on so yes, don't leave. We have announcements, but then we do have a review, and then we are going to talk about a couple of uh, games that got played in the last week. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more. Things always in the works, and now's the time to get in on the ground floor. 
Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, videos, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com. You'll find a spot to from the, uh, subscribe in the sidebar. Uh, this week, we're going to continue taking a look at a revised Patreon project and the various tiers we offer. This week, week, we're looking at the Lost and Found level. Now, this is the only physical reward tier we've got, where you actually get something. Every six months, Deanna is going to put together a gaming-centric goodies box and ship it right to your home. And Anshi Games is the one behind this one, and none of us know exactly what she has in mind for these geeky goodie boxes. Yes, so besides getting some great gaming swag at this level, you do get all the stuff from the previous backer levels, including the option to receive our Hot Deals newsletter, access to patron-only polls, which we used for today's topic, five bonus entries to any contest we have, like our currently running Medium giveaway. Bonus audio recorded during our live show, but cut from the podcast. Their questions bumped to the top of the question list, access to our pre-production show notes, an account on our private Discord channel, and access to patron-only blog posts. So someone head over to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and back at the lost and found level, just so we can see what Deanna has for you. All right, we just mentioned it. There is one week left in our medium giveaway. That is medium, the a mind-bending party game. Anyone who listens to the show knows I'm not a huge fan of party games, but I am a huge fan of this one. We're giving away two copies of Medium, the, the mind-reading party game, Greater Than Games, and Storm Chaser Games. This contest is open to anyone in Canada and the U.S. Uh, to enter, just head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on review, scroll down a little bit, find my Medium review, read it, and use the widget at the bottom to enter. All right, Breakout Con is now less than three weeks away. It's going to be hitting on March 20th to the 22nd, Sheridan Center, downtown Toronto. All three of us are going to be there. Lots of other great gamers are going to be there. One of the biggest GTA conventions, gaming conventions. A massive board game library, tons of rooms to play them in. Some of the biggest indie RPGs we've seen at a con, many of them being run by the designers themselves. Great panels and more find out more at breakoutcon.com head over to the blog and read my 2019 recap just to see why you want to go there because it is one of the best cons i have ever attended this will be our third year attending in a row i can't say enough good things about breakout con uh most welcome inviting safe space i've ever seen at a game convention up next a review of the trick-taking card game Gorus Maximus. Gorus Maximus was designed by Connor Magui and published by his Canadian publishing company, Inside Up Games. It features some rather over-the-top artwork from Quan Shai Moria. What? Just pointing at it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that threw me off. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were trying to get my attention. All right. What was I saying? Uh, features some over-the-top artwork by Quan Chai Moria. Gorus Maximus was funded on Kickstarter in 2018 and published and delivered in 2018. Now, the copy I reviewed was the standard retail edition of the game. As usual, the best way to see what you get in a copy of Gorus Maximus is to watch our Gorus Maximus unboxing video. For those of you out there who haven't had a chance to watch that video, what's in the Gorus Maximus box? All right, first, I do want to mention, I forgot this in the notes, that, um, well, I wasn't, I was given a copy of Gorus Maximus by Connor at Origins 2019. Uh, as far as I know, there were no strings attached. It wasn't like, hey, I want you to review this game, but I'm reviewing it anyway, but I do want it out there that I did not pay for this game. It was given to me when I was doing an interview with him about a completely different game. Uh, so, the box itself. First thing I noted was the fact that it has a QR code on the box for how to play. Cool. I want to see that more often. The other thing is, my God, is this a solid box? Like, it is like a thick, sturdy, like, I, I, you should ship stuff in this box. It's a nice, solid box. Not that that really matters that much for gameplay, but I was just impressed by the quality of the box. Uh, inside, there are multiple rule books in three languages. I think it was French, German, and English. Rules are only eight pages long, include a ton of examples, 
clear, easy to read, understand, though a little bit tiny on the font. And the Canadian flag for English is a nice touch that makes us Northerners happy to see. I do agree. I gotta admit, that, that is a nice bonus. Uh, the box then includes a solid plastic box insert, which is uh, well-designed, holds everything in place. It holds a deck box, a pack of cards, two stacks of poker chips, and a clear plastic clip. Now, the poker chips are used to track scoring in the game are extremely well-made. They have the, the weighted poker chips. They got that great feel in your hand. And I got to say, are really a step above. Like, I was not expecting to open a trick-taking card game and get, like, solid poker chips. That was a very nice touch. Another interesting touch is the tuck box I mentioned. Now, this is a box for holding cards. And what I didn't know when I recorded the unboxing video is that this is a travel box. It's just big enough to fit the components you need for a five-player game of Gorus Maximus, including cards that replace the poker chips. So if you know you're only going to have five players at your game night, you just pack this tuck box and leave the rest at home. I thought that was a cool upgrade from, again, something you don't normally see. So not often a game provides its own travel kit unless it's designed from the start as a travel game. Yeah, like basically you get the travel version of Gorus Maximus with Gorus Maximus, which is, heck, more games should do that, actually. Yeah. I would love to get a copy of Quirkle with a copy of Travel Quirkle with it. That's That would be an awesome... Start a trend, Connor, please. <laughs> <laughs> the cards themselves are uh, decent, I would say. Uh, they are thinner than standard playing cards. Um, repeated riffle shuffling is not being kind to them, so I make sure to flip them every time to make sure they don't crease too much. Um, not the best card quality, but not terrible either. Uh, now, the cards do feature a variety of rather bloody gladiators and beasts uh, in five different suits. Cards are numbered 0 to 15 in each suit. Each number features unique artwork where the color changes in each suit. So, like, whatever, the, the bear is always a 3, but, like, the bear has a blue background and a bear has a yellow background. Uh, information is easy to read, but it's only in one spot, which I thought was weird for a card game. So the, the, the suit information, the card number and how much points it's worth are in the top left corner only, whereas most card games it's repeated in both. So I was surprised to not see that. Everything's just in the one spot. Yeah, this was more frustrating than I expected during play. It's not a deal breaker by any means. No. And I get that they wanted to make sure that their art was right side up. But more handling of the cards every time you play. And for those who don't sleeve, especially, will mean the cards get that much more wear and tear over time. And we just mentioned they're a little thinner than a normal playing card already. Yeah, so, yeah it's one of those once you get dealt your hand, you're going to have to flip over a bunch of the cards, which is, it's kind of annoying. Now, finally, there is um, one extra card, which is for tracking which suit is Trump or what they call it in the game. It's it's what gladiatorial, uh, I can't even remember, what, what house is, is being favored by the crowd or something is the theme, sorry, it's Trump. Uh, and then there's a plastic clip that goes on that card. Now, we had some real complaints about a sliding clip in another game recently. This one work better? No, like no one should put plastic clips in board games, I think, like seriously. Uh, this is a cheap piece of plastic, and every time I slide it on the card, I feel like I'm going to like damage the card. It's going to crease it. It's going to strip it. And most games, what I do is I just put the clip on top of the, the, like, if you look on the blog post, you can see a picture of the card. It's got colored bands, and I just put the clip on top. Now, since I'm doing that, what I would have loved, and I think this would have been an awesome upgrade, is like a little gladiator meeple or something. I could just stand on the appropriate house. That would work even better than the clip. I'm really disappointed by this clip. But you know what? It doesn't really affect the gameplay. All right, well, how do you play this gladiatorial trick-taking game? All right, so you build the deck. So how many suits you use and which cards in each suit is determined by the number of players. And every player count from one, yes, this does play solo, all the way up to eight has a different deck setup, all of which end up being there being exactly 10 cards per player based on the player count. Each round, the entire deck is dealt out to all players. So it's perfect information for a card game, which is cool because it means, well, assuming you're good at counting cards, you can keep track of all of that. And this is a big plus, like real trick taker, real trick taking game lovers are going to be card counters. You can definitely card count in this game. Now, how much time and effort is it to set up the card sort for each player count? Like if you wanted to play a few times and you change the player count every time, is that, is it problematic? I don't think so. Uh, in, in general, as long as you put the game away properly, in my opinion. So I, I think your big thing is at the end of the game, make sure you sort all your, your stacks and take the time to put them in numeric order. 
because all it is is a matter of pulling out so many cards each time. So, like, I'm going to forget the exact numbers. But if you were playing six players, you do not use the 14, 15, and I don't think you use the one, two, and three, or it might be the one, two. I don't remember the exact number. So you're just pulling four colors out of each suit. Um, plus, with the lower player counts, you're not even using all the suits. So, like, when we play three players, you only use three suits. So you can just toss as long as your cards are separated when you're done playing, which isn't hard to do like they're very well color coded it's very easy to see and for people with color blindness there are symbols in that also show instead like i we never talked about what they were but like i think the blue is a fist and the green is an arrow or whatever we always just said blue green yellow with the people we're playing with but we didn't have anyone playing that had color problems or eye problems and we don't really worry about theme on this show too often so you know it's yeah. just color yeah gladiatorial schools I think is what it is. Whichever school is prominent at the time. I'm sorry. It, it's a trick taking game. I'm going to call it Trump. Uh, so why do you actually start playing? The first card led sets the Trump suit for the turn, the whatever important house. And that's marked on that Trump card with that place plastic clip either on or on top of the card. Everyone that has to follow suit, just like every other trick taking game, you cannot play off. If you can't follow suit, you can play off suit. Highest played card wins. Highest played card in the lead suit wins. Unless someone played Trump, then it's the highest Trump card wins. Like, that's every trick-taking game you've ever played with any deck of cards. Now, the important change, and this is kind of what makes the game, is what they call issuing a challenge. Now, this is done by playing the exact same numbered card as the player before you. When you do this, Trump changes to the suit used to challenge. What this means is that Trump can change even multiple times in one hand of cards. So it's almost a blend of like a Euchre and a Crazy Eight yes. uh, for those casual card players out there. Yeah, I, I was comparing you. I said Euchre. Crazy Eights is probably a better comparison. I was thinking Euchre and um, and Uno, but yeah, same same idea. Now the player that takes the trick gets the lead for the next round. They're going to pile up all their winning tricks in front of them. No Trump is set at the beginning of the game. And only changes if someone issues a challenge, which is, is an important distinction. It doesn't change every round. Once a round's done, you're going to look at all the cards that you've collected, and then you're going to add up the point value of the cards. It's supposed to represent the fame of your gladiatorial house or whatever. The player with the most fame wins and takes one of the scoring tokens. Now, these poker ships literally only say one and two on them, because what happens is if you win a second round, you flip your token, and the person who wins the third round wins the entire game. Now, it's also worth noting that there are different point values on the cards, and every card is worth a different point amount, and some of these are negative. And here is the other shining example in this game, the, the killer app. And what this means is that this is not a game where you want to try to take all the tricks. Rather, it's about knowing when do you want to take a trick and when you don't, and knowing when to play off suit and punish the player you think is in the lead. And this is really where this game shines and steps away from your average trick-taking game. The fact that in some games, your high card will cost you points mm -hmm. really adds some strategy What to what could really easily be almost any trick-taking game with a standard deck of cards you see down at the Legion on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to see bringing this one out to a Knights of Columbus with that artwork. Uh, so in regards to overall thought, the first thing I do have to talk about is that artwork. I, I gotta say I'm not a fan. Um, while I understand the game is Gorus Maximus, it's basically saying maximum gore, I find it to be a bit over the top. There is blood everywhere on every card. They even did an effect to make the blood shiny. Uh, there's body parts and limbs flying everywhere. There's a, a lion belching out internal organs. It's overly gratuitous. And yeah, now for the unboxing on, th on video on YouTube, I actually censored part of the game box. Now, while this was mostly done tongue in cheek, at the same time, YouTube thumbnails are visible by anyone. This yeah. game, even the cover art, not. Yeah, it's definitely not. Now, I admit, the art has no impact on gameplay. And I even realized while playing, and this was pointed out by another player first, uh, the focus is when you're playing is on that information in the top left corner, which means while you're playing, you don't really notice the art, like at all. You almost gloss right over it. But the problem is that art is gratuitous and it is over top. And it, this is a really slick trick-taking game that I think my kids would love, especially Big G. But there is no way my kids would play this game. My kids don't even want to look at the cover of the box. My kids are very gore and blood adverse. And the artwork would literally scare them away from playing. 
and they'd probably have nightmares that night. Like, I would have much preferred the game be more accessible and family-friendly. And that's because it's actually a really good game. Yeah, it's it's interesting because they could have done Gladiator and not had gore. Like they yes. could like they could have they could have played with the theme and not gone to the place they did. But it's, it's just know, they it's made a choice. Yeah, they made a choice too far. Now that being said, content aside, the art is actually great quality. Yes, there's some real humor. And even continuity, so that when you spread out an entire suit, in order, it makes a panorama. Now, while not only that, it wraps. Yes, we found out. <laughs> and while the style may not be appropriate for everyone, it is really well done. Yeah, I, I have friends that love it. Cat loved it. Thinks the art's fantastic. All, all the power to him. And I will note that uh, we did get a comment from Connor that if we do want a family-friendly version, there may be something in the works. So that's interesting to know. Because overall, this is literally one of the best trick-taking games I have played at high player counts. While the game's okay with two and three, it really starts to shine once you add in more. And so far, based on all the times i played this, six seems to be the ultimate player count. But this plays eight. How many trick-taking games play eight people and play it well? Now, six, though, I think is is the sweet spot for this game just because the highest number, which is a 13 in a six-player game, is a minus two-point card. So this leads to those interesting decisions during the game and really rewards players who can keep track of who's got the 13s and how many have played. And that's enough. Like, for my level of play, that's the card counting I can do. I can keep track of the five 13s. I'm not going to keep track of where every card is. And in particular, actually, the eights in this game are very important. They're minus four points. So when I play at six players, I'm watching the eights and the thirteens. Every other card, I don't know who's got what. Yeah, no, the fact that this game is playable at higher uh, higher player counts and is not just, oh, look, it's another four-player trick-taking game is a really nice touch. Uh, yeah. And the way the game changes at each player count, just the added bonus uh, to make it that much more, uh, you know, strategy involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, overall, this is a great high player count trick taking game. Uh, if you like Euchre, Hearts, Spades, or those kind of games, and you find yourselves often with a group of five or more players, I strongly suggest checking out a copy of Goris Maximus. Though, as Deanna said, watch who you're playing with, right? This is not a game my mom's going to want to play. This is not a game I would have broke out at the Knights of Columbus. It's just not the right place for it. Now, also, I didn't mention it here. I do have a promo for this game, the Man Bear Pig. I'm not going to get into it here, but if you head over to the blog and check out my Boris Maximus review, I do give details on what this card does and why you might want to try to seek out a copy of the Man Bear Pig yourself. Well, for a somewhat more in-depth look at Goris Maximus, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here what games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Now, unfortunately, we've been dealing with stomach problems here after it's been mostly affecting the kids. Uh, I've also had some sinus stuff going on, and I don't know, 2020 has just been terrible this year for, for getting gaming in and people being healthy. I don't know what's going on. I uh, don't think it's anything dealing with the big not quite pandemic that's going on in the world just personal problems but it's been a slow week uh we had to cancel our leap day gaming event which man that is now three like i think we've given up i don't think we're rescheduling now sorry people i don't know maybe we, anytime it's it's cursed now at this point like we canceled new year's we canceled my birthday we canceled leap here like i don't know i don't know what's going on now thankfully by monday Everyone seemed to be feeling better. My kids went to school. Everything seemed to be going better. So we did get in some gaming. We, our, my Monday night group did show up. Uh, we didn't have enough to start our DCC campaign. That's coming. I know people are looking forward to it. At some point, we will play through a DCC funnel. I don't know when it'll happen. But in the meantime, we're working through the piles of shame and obligation. In this case, piles of obligate, or shame. These ones are not obligation. These are games I bought or got for Christmas. Uh, up first was our first four-player game of Clans of Caledonia. And man, I am digging this game. Like uh, the, the second play was even better. Like we played it first with Deanna and I, and it was really good with two players. And now I played it with four and I wouldn't actually say it's better with four, but rarely just as good. Like it's just as good two or four players, which is awesome to see. Um, 
This is a unique economic game set in the Scottish Highlands at the turn of the century where you're doing area control and you're producing milk and turning milk into cheese and you're getting wool and you're making whiskey and you're sending export duties and you're importing hops and tobacco. A really fantastic game. Uh, we played on Monday with Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, and Tom Barker, and both really liked it. And, like, Tom has this saying that I always find amusing because, to, to me, it's his, like, seal of approval, right? And, it, and we finished it, and he went, oh, that's a good little game. Whenever Tom says that, you're like, oh, Tom liked this. Like, the last game he said it for was Orléans. So, like, it just Tom – Tom's – that's that's a, that's a good little game is, like, I, I need a picture of Tom's face and a, a logo, and we'll start throwing that on boxes. The, the, the Tom Barker Good Little Game Award, <laughs> which, like, as soon as you said it, I'm like, oh, yeah, Tom dug that one. I am really looking forward to playing this one a few more times. Um, I got to try a couple of the different clans. So this is like, um, I don't know how many there are. There's a lot. There's not as many as Terra Mystica, but there's probably eight or nine different clans you can play that add asymmetry. So I've only played two so far. And man, each clan really is different. Like the, the asymmetry on this is a, a huge, like they completely change your play style. I happened to be playing a clan that was all about aging their whiskey. So whenever I produce whiskey, I got extra money. And if I could not spend it for a couple turns, it ended up being worth even more. And I was terrible at it. I ended up never aging my whiskey to the end. Deanna played uh, one of the clans that was all about making cheese. So she could turn, turn or not cheese, uh, butter. She could turn her milk into butter instead of cheese and get paid for it. And then, oh, what the heck was Tom doing? Oh, Tom, Sean Hamilton had a thing where he, he was all about the market. And he was all about manipulating the market. And I really don't remember what Tom had for his clan. But man, unique, very different. I am really looking forward to playing it. I, I got to try it three player. I have a feeling three might be a sweet spot because man, that board was tight with four. Um, I think it's going to be good three player. But at this point, like I'll, I'll be doing up a full review after a few more plays. But like unless some disaster, we somehow find the broken clan or something, this one's going to be a positive review. Well, I can't say I'm all that surprised to hear about the positive review. After all, this is a top fifty game of is board it? game geek. Wow. Um, now, have you have you noticed uh, any sort of problems or adv advantages with any of the clans that you've played? I've seen some hints that they may not be perfectly balanced, but nothing nothing sort of. Uh, I don't know. Like we've only played twice, so it's so hard to tell at this point. I got to say, some feel. As Deanna pointed out, Tom could get two orders at once. That seemed ridiculously powerful. Tom didn't seem to take advantage of it, but he was his first time playing. That seemed powerful, but I don't know. Like, they're so asymmetric. Like, they're so different. It'd be so hard to, like, I don't even know how they play tested it to figure out which right. is better than others. Like, what with what Dee could do with her milk was, I guess, somewhat similar to what I could do with the whiskey, but not. And then what Tom could do was a totally different focus where you're not working on building resource, but fulfilling orders. And then Sean's was all about going to the market and buying and selling things as often as possible, right? Like those are all so different strategies that I don't know, nothing we've seen. I had no clue it was a top 50 at this point. That's impressive. Yeah, no, it's, it's not uh, that old. It's, it's very strongly, uh, strongly recommended. Yeah. Which I get it so far, like really impressed. Uh, this one, it's, it's a quicker than expected game. Like we do a three to four hour game night when we finished, it was only like 11. So we, it was probably about two hours, not included a, a, a rule teach. And it's not a quick teach. It's no Terra Mystica, but it's definitely more than say Ad Azul. Okay. Um, so we finished a bit early. So I grabbed something off my personal shelf of shame. This was Ardis. This is an older, like quite a bit older, a Leah game. Uh, put out by Ravensburger. Uh, my mother-in-law got me this. Uh, she got it at our 2019 Extra Life auction. It was in our silent auction and gave it to me for my birthday. This is a really neat abstract game that I swear has flown under absolutely everyone's radar. It's very loosely based on Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, but all they're really getting at is the fact there are knights in a big round table. Um, you set up this table that I don't know how many spots it has, but a lot. A uh, ton of seats around a big round table. You put out four pawns representing princes. Uh, these are in silver and gold. And uh, they sit at specific chairs equidistant from each other. You put these little plastic rings on the pawns to represent that they're princes. One of them's crowned king who has three rings, and that's Arthur. You then turn the table so that the king's seat is there. Then players place their own pawns representing knights around the table. And then each seat at the table is worth points from negative 14 to 10 points with the seat to the right of the king being worth 10. 
and then the seat to the left is actually zero. So like the 14 is a little further away. And again, this would be awesome if I could show you a graphic right now to hold it up. Now, each turn, you're going to play cards, and you have two choices of cards. You can either take knight cards or prince cards. The knight cards let you move your knights. The prince cards let you move the princes or the king or put a ring on a prince. Everyone starts with an identical deck of cards, but they're shuffled. So you don't know exactly what everyone has, but you do know everything out there. So it's somewhat perfect information. Now, when a piece moves, it has to go clockwise around the table. And you're going to score points based on what seat you left. And then wherever you go to, if someone's sitting there, they get bumped to the first empty seat counterclockwise. Now, there are a couple special cards that let you go backwards. And then the ring cards let you put a new ring on one of the princes. And if a prince ever gets three rings, they get crowned king. And then you turn the whole table again. Like it's 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 a really neat game that gives you a really rough idea of it. There are two ways to play. There are also scoring cards. We did not try those. We only tried the basic game without the scoring cards. So we haven't seen even the full game yet. But man, it's good. Like I, I love Aaliyah games. Like I, I'm definitely like we said many times. I'm not about the new hotness here. I love the older Euro games. The 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 like um, almost all the old Stefan Feld's Aaliyah games. Bora Bora Macau. Uh, Castles of Burgundy, Princes of, these aren't all Steffenfelds, Princess of Florence, uh, Ra, uh, Through the Desert. These are all Leah games. There's this one company that published all these German games, brought them to North America. Ravensburger was the, the who localized most of them. I like love every game in the series. I've yet to play an Aaliyah game I did not like. So I had no clue what the hell w was going on with this game. Like, I had no clue. I've never heard of it. I just saw Leah on the box. I'm like, oh, I bet you that's good. Oh, it is. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting. It's it's well rated, and it's had some appearances at the, in the Golden Geeks, but it has less than a thousand ratings on yeah, Golden Geek. Like, um, and there does seem to be a strong leaning towards who as the best player count. Huh? And okay. I did hear some people complaining that because of the rotation of the the table that happens, it doesn't feel necessarily like it's going to last as long as some people might like a, a game to. I, I, based on the component quality, it, it did some neat things to make it spin. It's actually using like a standee right. that goes under the board and then there's a hole where the standee goes. I don't know. I think you'd have to play an awful lot to damage it. I'd be more worried about my cards in Gorus Maximus than I would about the, the board in, um, in Ardis. Okay, there we go. But yeah, like this is, I, I expect Aaliyah to be good. This was great fun. Simple mechanics, rather intriguing board. I, I just very solid. Like, I, this is a hidden gem. Like, I have heard nothing. Like, over all the years, like, I, I watch the Aaliyah games. I, I pay attention to when new Aaliyah games come out. But this actually came out before I was into Aaliyah games, so I didn't know to look for it. And I'm like, man, it's it's just a neat game. Like, I really, really neat game. I Like, just sh kind of shockingly good. Cool. Oh. Well, how about a look ahead? Uh, what do you have planned for the coming week? All right. So I talked about this over on our Discord server, uh, which all of you should be members of. You just got to go back our Patreon. Uh, on our Discord server I talked about, I actually sat down and brought out the Less Shame More Game Challenge Excel spreadsheet I had made when we made the, uh, the start of 2019. I said I was going to play every game of my pile of shame, which I was doing a really good job until I went to Origins as Tabletop Bellhop and started getting review copies, which it's awesome. We're getting review copies. I can't complain about that. But it changed the pile of shame into the pile of my old games, and now I have a pile of obligations and so on. Kind of talked about this before. So I went through, and I made sure it was up to date, and I marked everything I played, and I marked everything I've done an unboxing video on of and I marked everything I need to do a review of and what I've actually done a review of. So I basically did the work to see where we're at for, for obligations versus that. And there are a surprising number of reviews I would like to get done. We have played a lot of the games. As far as playing, there's very little that didn't get played, didn't get to the table at least once or a couple times. But I am like 19 reviews short on where I'd like to be. I definitely want to have all these done before I hit Origins 2020, and that's coming up fairly soon. So I am going to be doing a big push locally for my Monday night group. If we're not playing DCC, we're going to be playing something on the pile of obligation. And that's what I'm thinking is probably going to happen this weekend. So originally, Deanna and I were talking about playing two-player games, but bigger ones, longer ones, Twilight Imperium or Twilight Struggle or War of the Ring. But you know what? Both of those are Pile of Shame, not Pile of Obligation. So that may switch up. We might try to get some other stuff played. 
I, I there's no local gaming event. Sorry, Windsor gamers, nothing going on this weekend that I know of. I'm sure there's stuff going on in the city, but there's there's nothing I'm personally involved in going on on the seventh. So, and Brimstone's game night is no longer the first of the month, so that even that's not going on this weekend. So as far as I know, it's an open weekend, and I'll probably have some people over to my house. Um, the next one, the big one, I want to play is Orleans. I am so ready to review, but we still haven't tried the Intrigue board. And I got to admit, I've heard a lot of negative things about this board. So that's part of why I've been putting it off. I have a feeling I'm going to agree with pretty much everyone else's review, but I do have to try it before we can get the review out there. So I want to do that. And another change that's probably going to happen is to get these in. We don't have 19 weeks before Origin, so we're going to probably start upping to two reviews a podcast. So we're going to probably double our review segment length. Uh, maybe not, because maybe I'll do shorter recaps, but we'll try to fit two games in going forward to get caught up. And so Gold West, I will be reviewing next week. That's my goal. Monday will be the Gold West unboxing video will be live, which everyone who's listening on the podcast, that would have been yesterday. So it's out there. But next Wednesday, next podcast, I'll talk about Gold West and um, maybe be able to fit in, say, Orléans as well. Well, and my son has uh, rediscovered Fortnite, as I was mentioning. Oh, so, that's cool. Uh, not a lot of board gaming going on, but uh, we're getting some uh, father, father, son, son kill time. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a big thing coming up too, right? We got we have Breakout coming up. Breakout's coming up really soon. We're going to do a big recap episode. I know some people hate them. Some people love them. You know what? The the con loves it if no one else. And so <laughs> we'll, we'll pay them back that way. Uh, Sean's going to hit some panels. We're going to play some games. I have a very open schedule compared to this last year. I, um, I need to recheck again because my schedule was looking reasonably busy but i know there were some there was games and stuff that wasn't on sketch yet yeah so i need to to go back in and recheck and maybe even rejig depending yeah. on how things fall because like there was a gen game that i wanted to get in but she said she had two games playing and i only found one at the time so yeah so the other thing too is uh deanna and i are taking a short vacation uh mon sunday monday tuesday we are going to be out of Windsor doing our own thing. And I am sure we'll get some two player games in because that is part of what we do when we go on vacations. I'm sure there'll be some games that are on our list tonight that we'll get some play this coming weekend. Uh, then the 14th, 14th CG Realm. Uh, it's the second Saturday of the month. We will be at the CG Realm 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. playing tabletop games. No, that does include miniature games. You Windsor gamers who are like, oh, I don't want to go out to board game night. Come on, it's tabletop night. I don't know why you miniature gamers need to have your own night and do your own thing. Just all come out, play some games. Uh, and then the week after that, there will be the event at Easy Mode. So if anyone in Windsor wants to head out to Easy Mode on the 21st of March, uh, fair warning, I won't be there. But Roger Malash, patron of the show, awesome, retired, gamery old fart, as he likes to call himself, will be bringing games and making sure there's plenty of stuff for people to play. So he's going to be taking over my role as host on the 21st at easy mode. And then the 28th of March, we will be back at CG realm for both the 14th and the 28th. I don't have, know what game we're going to have. So I don't know what we're going to feature. I'm going to be bringing games off my pile of obligation. That's my goal. So. Hey, we really need to work that out a little bit better. Cause we've been in the VIP scene now for, for a, couple, oh, sorry. a couple of dates there. Oops. That's fine. No, I just, we just need to have it so that I don't know. I, I didn't I, I didn't fill the section. Yeah, know, That's I part know. of the problem. I didn't I didn't write this section ahead of time. That's fine. All right. Well, now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP <laughs> guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. <clears throat> Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Colin Massey. Thank you. Kator. Thank you both, though. You stink for missing last week's Gloomhaven, though. I guess that was a pretty good reason. Duran Barnett. And a big welcome to our newest patron, Timothy Smith. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to drop the portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please check out our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to go live in your podcatchers and on YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights
Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around, join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. A couple of packages. For Tabletop <laughs> Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.